Did a lot happening in our neighboring country there, Kampala, Uganda. Well, let's now talk about women empowerment. And I'm now joined by Mandy Njonjo, who is the regional director for Hivos East Africa. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Adam. Well, uh, let's just begin by Hivos has been around for quite some time. 50 years. All right. And uh, one of the biggest conversations right now in Africa is uh, how do we scale up entrepreneurship? So based on some of our experiences in Kenya, we find that this usually requires a slew of services. So one of the biggest problems that most early stage entrepreneurs will talk about is a lack of access to capital. So that's definitely one of the areas that needs to be looked at. Uh, entrepreneurs need capital, especially when they're trying to survive the two year, that tends to be a period where they basically either live or die, mm -hmm. and most unfortunately tend not to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have to make extra investments when it comes to the ecosystem. So for example, how do you help banks de-risk uh, their lending, especially when it's around the frontiers of entrepreneurship that hasn't really happened in the country. Mm -hmm. And some other things that could also be done to also support entrepreneurs is also by supporting capacity building or also the knowledge development of people who are starting off in this field. Yeah. So this tends to be largely in the form of grants uh, where people are able to go and get some sort of business development. You learn how to plan a budget, you learn how to manage your books, and it's these sorts of support that we think helps jumpstart uh, entrepreneurship and helps scale it to the next level. All right. And uh, talk to us about uh, what has been the experience in uh, East Africa and Kenya, to be precise. So, as you mentioned, our work tends to be in the East African region. And for the Kenyan-specific examples, we tend to focus on a few sectors. So some of the sectors we have quite a passion for are around the creative industry. We also look at renewable energy, uh, sustainable agriculture, and we also have a new interest in the textile and clothing space. Mm -hmm. So our work in this has focused on various fronts. So some of the instruments we've used in Kenya include providing financing to financial institutions, uh, and also de-risking this capital so that these financial institutions can then make loans to organizations that are trying to, ex to exist in this space. Mm -hmm. So we find this is particularly useful, especially like about 10 years ago, when we were trying to make the case that mm -hmm. farmers are 10 to 15 years ago, that farmers are a bankable lot, yeah. or renewable energy is something that is worth investing in. So that's one of the ways uh, in which we have basically been investing in. Another interesting thing has also been in terms of developing the ecosystem. So you'll find that uh, to some extent, like if you look at the textile and clothing sector, mm -hmm. you need to look at uh, the people who are living, our tertiary, our tertiary institutions. Do they know how to produce? for the 21st century? Is our curriculum tailored and developing people who can actually compete uh, in this environment? So there's also that that also has to go in, as well as, of course, uh, trying to make sure that you try and link people to business opportunities. Interesting. And uh, Mandy, talk to us about, uh, of course, uh, SMEs in mm -hmm. Africa, majority still uh, very uh, underfunded, mm -hmm. issues of uh, capacity, from uh, business acumen to financial literacy, yeah. all these are major challenges. Yeah. For you as a company, how do you address this, especially when it comes to the funding gap? So, HIVOS, what we tend to do is that we are a social and environmental justice organization. So, well, if I take the example of, of seed entrepreneurs, or entrepreneurs that are working in the agricultural space. Mm -hmm. I think part of what we also try and do is to try and resolve the inconsistencies that make farmers who grow the majority of our food also uh, one of the most food insecure people in the country. So we start by trying to resolve the social justice angles there. And then there are certain work and investments that also have to be done on the entrepreneurs themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's also what we call the ecosystem approach, where we are trying to work with people who can then, uh, so if it's the banks, if it's the financial institutions, yes. uh, if it's the law, the policy makers, to try and make sure that we have an enabling environment. Mm -hmm. And then more directly, um, I think an easier way of also trying to help, especially like the really innovative entrepreneurs, 
is that we try and also give grants, uh, but it's in very specific industries uh, when we're trying to jumpstart an industry that hasn't been seen in Kenya before. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, it's also providing um, wholesale capital to um, financial institutions okay. and de-risking their, their investments. I'm keen to find out how much have you um, spent so far and what are you looking to expand? Uh, how much have we spent so far this year or since we started? Because Hebus yeah. has been around for 50 years. Yeah. And on average, I would say um, it fluctuates, but maybe from about uh, 10 million to about 15 million USD, sorry, right. euro per year. So that's about... Um, Almost uh, hitting uh, 150 million. Something like that, yes. All right. And uh, looking at uh, the economy right now, there's a big push towards uh, increasing uh, power supply. And uh, the government is having the big four agenda, mm -hmm. trying to, of course, scale up uh, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an organization, how are you looking to tap into this, especially for renewable energy? So one of the things that the government has been putting a lot of their investment in is in trying to expand the grid uh, so that you re they're able to reach more and more Kenyans. Mm -hmm. I think this is very laudable and it's something that is to be encouraged, especially when you look at our energy mix and you see that it is predominantly a renewable energy portfolio that goes into mm -hmm. our energy supply. Um, where actors such as HIVOS can be useful to providing renewable energy, especially to the energy poor, yeah is if we make investments in off-grid solutions, so for example, investing in mini-grids. So where the grid isn't able to go or where there are no immediate plans of taking the grid, we find that mini-grids provide a really good way of providing energy access to power. And when you look at the numbers, they really make sense because mini-grids tend to have about 2% downtime mm -hmm. as opposed to a rather appalling 53% uh, for the national grid. Mm -hmm. um, Another way we're doing this is also by trying to invest in cooking solutions. Because you'll find that, uh, unfortunately, about 90% of Kenyans rely primarily on biomass. Mm -hmm. And I say unfortunately because it tends to be unsustainable biomass. So um, another way that Hivos is also trying to invest in this is by seeing how do you have things like uh, biomass briquettes which can be made from the byproducts of our agricultural waste and also from municipal waste, which is quite an intriguing thing to me because I like the idea of generating um, wealth mm -hmm. or energy from waste. So those are some of the ideas and some of the projects that we're looking at when it comes to trying to expand renewable energy in the country. All right. And uh, over and above doing a lot of work in the energy sector, the push around uh, cheaper power is very uh, vocal right now. We're seeing uh, power costs is a, a, a subject that uh, is keeping Kenyans out there speaking on these issues. And I just want to also get your stand on this. Um, so I have maybe a bit of a two-bit answer to that. I think the first is what certain campaigns, citizen-led campaigns actually, like switch off KPLC that's led by Tapalombo and Cherotich say, mm. I think what they've really spotlighted, in addition to the inconsistencies mm -hmm. that exist in the energy sector, the other thing they've also spotlighted is that we really need to invest in transparency in the energy sector. So to some extent, um, as a Kenyan, there are certain things I can do to try and cut down my consumption. Mm -hmm. However, if the game is stacked against me, and I was never ever really going to make savings because of the inconsistencies that exist, then you'll find this is something that needs to be tackled. And it's something that needs to be tackled uh, rather urgently because um, affordable power uh, from both a domestic and from an industrial perspective is something that is the backbone and the mainstay of our industries and also like how we live uh, productive lives. So I think that's one of the things that needs to happen. And I think the second um, is also continuing to invest in our renewable energy. So for example, Kenya, as I said, we have a really good energy mix. We also have um, an interesting factoid. We have the highest geothermal potential in the world. It's currently at 10 uh, gigawatts. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't tapped 
uh, into even half of that. So it's also continued investment in these renewable energy resources, uh, geothermal, wind, hydro, which has always been our mainstay. I think those are some of the things that now from a macro perspective that we can do to really try and increase our renewable energy um, sources. All right. And uh, as we wrap up, uh, Mendy, uh, women mainstreaming, uh, of course, continues to elicit all manner of reactions, mm -hmm. especially in a day and age where we are seeing uh, the boy child mm -hmm. is also under pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your interactions mm -hmm. with the market mm -hmm. and, of course, uh, trying to in see more women in uh, leadership, more mm -hmm. women empowered, mm -hmm. um, how do we have a sustainable approach to this? Um, first, I like the way that you did pitch it as a binary, that it's either the guy, the girl child or the boy child. Um, I think um, one of the ways we can have a continued sustained approach is by first recognizing um, some of the obstacles that prevent um, the women from reaching their full potential. So if I pick up, for example, clean cooking, so renewable energy as yeah. an easy example, you'll find that about 15,000 women every year die from indoor air pollution because uh, they're cooking in houses where, you know, with firewood, it's not safe. And uh, there was a startling statistic that said cooking in these environments is equivalent to smoking something like two packets of cigarettes a day. And where women are spending um, sometimes up to seven days, sorry, seven hours a day uh, looking for firewood, you'll find that it prevents them from actually achieving their full potential. So to answer your question, mm. I think one of the ways in which we can actively promote um, female leadership uh, and not at the detriment of the boy child is by starting to deconstruct some of the obstacles that women face every day from really tapping into their true potential. All right. Yeah. Perfect place to end the conversation. Thank Many you, thanks. And uh, we definitely 